Good morning. Okay, we're going to jump into Proverbs. We're in chapter 11 this morning. We'll pick up with the verses 1 through 16. So essentially we want to continue in the way in which we have been for the last several weeks of just going through each of these verses and just talking a little bit about what is being said and how these verses might apply to your life. And in particular, the, uh, the common sense that is, uh, that is here inside of God's Word. And really, a lot of what we see here in Proverbs is exactly that. It's common sense. Which I have to say my observation is, is that if there's any one thing that has been lost in society today, it's common sense. <laughs> I, I, I listen to people and some of the things that are going on in our society, and I just shake my head and go, really? Like, uh, for example, when McDonald's was sued because, uh, because somebody asked for hot coffee and then got upset because the coffee was hot. Hello? Is that, you realize that every time that you see a product that has some type of a warning on it, and you ask yourself the question, why is that warning there? Um, if, if, you go to, if you go to Ikea, and you look at Ikea, when you go to their snack bar, and they're advertising their hot dog, there's a statement that says, this does not represent the actual size. Hello? That means that somebody actually got upset that their hot dog wasn't that big. Every time you see one of these statements, it means that somebody has challenged it and tried to make an issue out of something, regardless of how weird it is. <laughs> that's, that's what we've come to be as a society. People have lost common sense. Okay, there's my commentary for the day. So, um, <laughs> so, so Proverbs gives us a guideline for how we practically understand the things around us. So, chapter 11, verse, uh, verse 1 and 2. The Lord detests the use of dishonest scales, but he delights in accurate weights. The, now, we, we don't, we kind of have diff difficulty understanding what this is talking about because we don't, you, you, you normally don't buy your products using scales. You know, in the old days, when you would go to the marketplace, now first of all, you didn't go to a store. We're spoiled because we can go to a store and everything's made out and wagered for us and, and uh, it's all packaged and it's all ready to go. And uh, You take for granted that the packaging is correct and because those things are kind of monitored. So how many of you, when you come home and you have your loaf of bread and it says it's, you know, 10.3 ounces, you get out your scale and you weigh it to make sure that you've got an accurate loaf of bread in the package? Anybody? I didn't think anybody was that paranoid. But, but, but that's, that, that's what kind of happens now is everything's packaged for you. You know, you buy a package of uh, Lay's potato chips and it's 10.4 ounces. You do this, that, and the other things, and so many ounces. Back in the old days, when you went to the marketplace, you would buy everything according to its weight. And how many ounces, or in most of the world, how many kilograms. But you would go and you would go to the marketplace and you'd say, I want so much of this. And they would put it on the scale and they would weigh it for you right in front of you. Well, sometimes uh, vendors would have little tricks that they would use in order to make the weight appear off a little bit. So that it was just a little tiny bit heavier. So they would either have the, 
they would have uh, a difference between the the uh, the platform that you would use for weighing. So normally um, scales are a balance. So what would happen is, is you would have the 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 weights on one side and you have your product on another side and what you do is you take the product and put it there and then you take the weights and you put weights on it in order to balance them out. And when they come in the middle and they're balanced then that means that it's fair. But sometimes they would change the platform a little bit so that it was just a tiny bit uh, heavier. Or sometimes they would put their finger on it just the right way. Or if you're using an electronic scale like what they use nowadays, like when you go to the deli and you buy ham or turkey or slice, you know, something sliced and they put it on the scale, the scale automatically weighs it out. Those things are supposed to be balanced and accurate. And there are vendors who, are, who cheat and would try to make it heavier. And what, what is being said here is that that type of dishonesty, the Lord hates. You know, he wants people to be, uh, he wants people to be forward. When was the last time you went to a gas station and bought gas for four dollars a gallon? You, or, or did it actually say three point ninety nine? Or, or four, or four nine point ninety nine? And what people say to me all the time is. Well, I, I bought my gas for $4.06 a gallon, let's say. And I go, really? Or did you really buy it for $4.07 a gallon because it's point nine? Why can't they say, round it off like they're supposed to? Because in the average person's mind, they don't calculate that extra penny that exists there because of the way it's stated. And really, it's a form of cheating. It's mentally, you're manipulating people to, you know, to think that it's costing them less when actually it's costing them more. And don't think that a penny doesn't add up. In, in Superman 3, which was a terrible movie, but in Superman 3, the whole premise was, was that the bank wasn't uh, putting all these pennies, it was, they was just set off to a fund someplace and the whole deal was was that this computer person was going to go in and steal all of those pennies that had been added up. And it came out to millions of dollars. They add up. So dishonesty, the Lord doesn't like. So when you're doing things, you need to do things in a manner that you're accurate in how you do things. Don't cheat people is what's being said. God, not only do people don't like it when they get caught, but God sees everything and he doesn't like it at all. That's what's being said. Uh, pride leads to disgrace, uh, but with humility comes wisdom. There's another passage in Proverbs that says pride goes before the fall. Be careful about the concept of pride. Verse 3. Honesty guides good people. Dishonesty destroys treacherous people. As much as possible, you should try to be honest in your dealings. In, 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 in our fellowship, meaning as believers, not specifically Aletheia, although of course it would apply here, but as, as Christians, as those who are disciples of Christ, we should understand clearly the concept of honesty. There is no such thing as a white lie. You know how people say, well, it's just a white lie. There's, you know that there's, there's misrepresentation by the absence of saying anything. There are lots of people who misrepresent truth by not telling the whole story. There's lots of ways to manipulate people by leaving out truths. 
You're not really lying to them, but you're not really being truthful either. You know, as believers, that's inappropriate. I know that's a heavy standard, but that's inappropriate. Part of what we need to do is we need to own up to what it is that we're trying to share and, and be truthful in how we do it. Why? Because the God we serve is a righteous God and a holy God, and there is no place for those things which are not righteous or holy or truthful. As far as we're concerned as a body, what does aletheia mean? Truth. We are stating in our name that it is our desire to be truthful in all that we do. And so it's something that we need to try to practice as much as possible in everything that we do. Now, the flip side of that is that people who are not truthful, here's, here's the thing that you should know. And for young people, this is really important because this is kind of a guiding principle. Um, the problem with lying or not telling the truth is that you have to remember what it is that you said when you lied. Or you have to remember how you manipulated in order to deal with what you're dealing with. And it's been my experience that nine times out of ten people can't do that. And so eventually whatever the mistruth is that they told catches up with them. And then you got this whole big mess that you're going to try to deal with. So it's always more important, when whatever the deal is, it's always more important to be truthful. Then you don't have to worry about lying. Now there are kind ways to do things so that you don't, you know, offend people because people get so offended and, and you know. We, I've been told that we should be relational. So we should try as much as possible not to offend people in how we approach things. So, you know, if you're eating now or you're eating with somebody and they've gone through the trouble of preparing you a dinner and, quite frankly, you just don't like that food and they say, how was the dinner? You shouldn't say, you know what, I thought it sucked, I don't like it. You can still tell them that they, you appreciate, well, I appreciate that you went through all this trouble and, and thank you for that. Not my favorite, but thank you. So you're still saying the same thing, but you're not just being bloody honest. And so that's, a, that's something that you have to work on learning how to do. But truth, try to be as honest as possible in all that you do. You won't get caught up. Verse 4, riches won't help on the day of judgment, but right living will save you from death. What type of death are we talking about here? Spiritual death. Christ is correct. Spiritual death. We are all going to face the judgment day. There is no question to that. In the real world, in the physical world that we live in, we all know that there are people that are wealthy that don't answer to the same consequences as people that are not. But when we all stand before the judgment seat of God and we all die, all of that wealth and everything else that people try to accumulate will be gone. We will all be stripped naked. We will have nothing. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God and according to God's word, we will stand in judgment. Now, um, from a theological standpoint, Many people in the church have been told because we're covered by the blood of Christ that we're not going to stand in judgment for anything that we've done because we're covered by the blood of Christ. I disagree with that. There's several places in Scripture that, that clearly indicate to us that Christians, those who are under the blood of Christ, are also going to stand a judgment. We will stand a judgment as to how it is that we have used those things which God has given us. We will stand a judgment as to how it is that we have lived. 
in according to our knowledge of who God is and what he requires of us, there will be a judgment of the saints according to what scripture says. The blood of Christ covers us so that we might be able to enter into the throne room of God. But the reality of it is, is that we will stand in judgment. Therefore, you should put your eggs in the basket of living righteously, not trying to accumulate things according to the way of the world. And there's a big difference. The reason I don't have riches today is because I prefer to live for God. Now, if he happened to give me the riches, that's another story, and some people he does. But generally speaking, we should be living to please God, not to please man, not to accumulate those things which are going to be destroyed. Read Matthew chapter 6 and 7. Very exciting. Reiterating what was stated earlier, verse 5, the godly are directed by honesty, the wicked shall fall beneath the load of their sin. We've already talked about that. I won't reiterate. Six, the godless, the excuse me, the godliness of good people rescues them. The ambition of treacherous people traps them. Here's something that you can live by. I'm what? I'm 50 plus years old. I accepted Christ when I was 12. I came from a very, very dysfunctional family. I can relate to many of you in the struggles that you've gone through with your family heritage that you came out of, because I came out of that type of a situation. Let me tell you something. There have been many people who have made accusation against me because of my stand for Christ on various issues. There have been many people who have, you know, said things which were unkind because of my background and because of where I came from. God has always vindicated. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes years. But God has always vindicated. I do not focus on the gossip and what people have to say and what their perception of me is. I am interested in what scripture says I'm supposed to be and how I am to live according to what scripture says. And you can imagine that as believers you can pretty much expect that if you live for Christ that people are not going to be happy with you. You can pretty much imagine that if you're going to do things the way that God's Word says they should be done, there are going to be people that are going to be upset with you. This idea that when you accept Christ, life is going to be a bed of roses is nonsense. That's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that because you take a stand for God, you're going to go through suffering and hardship. Read First and Second Peter. That you're going to struggle because you're now in opposition to the world in which you live. But what this scripture says here in Proverbs is, is that you are going to be vindicated. Continue on the path that you are. You are going to be vindicated. Seven, when the wicked die, their hopes die with them, for they rely on their own feeble strength. Amounts to nothing when the wicked die. Sad. But it does. Eight, the godly are rescued from trouble, and it falls on the wicked instead. I've already talked about that. I want to reiterate. Nine, with their words, the godless destroy their friends, but the righteous will rescue your knowledge will rescue the righteous. How we live. And the things that we do, governed by what? By knowledge. And what is the practical application of knowledge? Wisdom. 
practical application of knowledge is wisdom. You know, we live in a knowledge age. Man, I'll tell you anything that you want to know. Wikipedia. It's all here. You have questions about, you're not quite sure of what something is? Google. You can find it. You're not quite sure because you got some medical things going on. How are you going to deal with these medical things? What is it? You don't know. WebMD. Yeah, we, 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 have, we have at our fingertips knowledge. Greg was, a, Greg was a pharmacist as a profession. He went to school and studied pharmaceuticals. If I'm curious about a drug today, punch it in tells me what it does, what it shouldn't do, what the reactions are, different kind of drugs which are synonymous but not as expensive, gives me everything at my fingertips. He studied for years to learn this stuff so that he could direct people. Now I just kind of go to the computer and go, okay, there we go. I don't need a pharmacist. I tell my doctor when I go see my doctor, I say, you know, really, no disrespect intended, but the only reason that I come to you is because I can't prescribe medicine for myself. I already know what's going on because, hey, we live in an information age. So we live in an age of knowledge, and there's lots of knowledge going on out there. But we don't live in an age of wisdom. What is the practical application of knowledge? How do you walk so that you walk wisely in the choices that you make? My favorite saying these days as an old man is, she chose poorly. Or, or the converse of that, and yes, there are wise decisions. Rose and I were talking about an event today and I responded, of course, she responded before I did because we've lived so long together, we know how we think. I chose wisely. You have to learn how to choose, and we're in the process of doing that. Verse 10, the whole city celebrates when the godly succeed. Well, we can hope. <laughs> they shout for joy when the wicked died. Do you, do you guys remember seeing what happened when Osama bin Laden was killed? Yeah. Did, I mean, it was kind of sad. I understand he was a terrorist, and I understand that, you know, he uh, orchestrated lots of bad things, and I understand that, you know, from our American perspective that he was a terrible person. But people were rejoicing in the streets. Well, the scripture says that, you know, that will happen for somebody who's really wicked. Wow. Wow. Upright citizens are good for a city and make it prosper, but the talk of the wicked tears it apart. Upright citizens are good for the city. Here's practical advice. Learn to be an upright citizen. Learn the laws. Obey the laws. So long as the laws do not conflict with the word of God, obey the laws. That's what scripture teaches. Pay your taxes. I deal all day with people who don't pay taxes. Pay your taxes. People say to me, how can you be a pastor and be a tax collector? They don't, they don't seem to come together. This is very simple. Scripture teaches that we are to be good citizens. Scripture teaches that we are to live in such a way that we glorify God. When I'm, I'm in the... I'm, in almost the last chapter of writing my book. 
for business. It's not a theological book, it's a business book. But I have one whole chapter where I deal with nothing but taxation. The history of taxation. Why is it important for us to understand taxation? Because, Wendy, yes. Because, well, okay, but more importantly, there are two things in life that you cannot, you will not escape. What are they? Death and taxes. I've got a chapter where I talk nothing about the history of taxation. There will always be taxation. Because in order for societies to exist, you must follow the basic game plan is that if you're going to play, you got to pay. That's what I tell my, my, my taxpayers. Dude, if you're going to play, you got to pay. Everybody does. This is saying, be a good citizen. Good citizens understand that when society is operating the way it's supposed to, we benefit from that. But when society is chaotic, and there are evil people that are controlling society, it's very, very, very difficult for us. Learn how to be a good citizen. How many of you are going to vote? Churches are not supposed to talk about partisan voting. Let me just tell you something. If you're a citizen of the United States, even though you may not like the choices that are present, even if you may not agree with everything that those who want to be or are in power, you have a responsibility to vote. That's part of being a good citizen. Let your voice be heard. Become understanding of the issues and be able to talk about the issues. We are so blessed in this nation that if we don't like something, you can vote and change it. The legislators in both Oregon and Washington, but the, the, those who are in power right now have this fixation on, on equality in regard to uh, gays and, and lesbians. In Oregon, they've tried a couple times. Most recently, in the state, in the in the county of Multnomah, the county leaders in Multnomah County uh, stated that, that they were going to allow uh, gay marriage. Well, they, actually, they, they defined it as partnerships, legal partnerships. Um, so they passed that, and all the gays and everybody rushed to Multnomah County to be married uh, in Multnomah County. What did the people of the state of Oregon do? They rose up and had enough signatures to put on the ballot a referendum. You know what a referendum is? Young people, do you know what a referendum is? Well, I'm kind of taking it back, but basically it says, woo, you guys are legislators, you put something into law, but the people don't agree with it. And so we're going to challenge it under the law. And so you get enough signatures and basically you subject it to a vote of the people. Not a vote of representatives, but a vote of the people. Because the people are supposed to be represented by legislators, but not always the case. So you can have a referendum in order to deal with that. Right now in the state of Washington, the exact same thing is going on. The legislators put into place that the state of Washington, uh, gay marriage is uh, okay. And they've redefined their understanding of marriage. Governor Grimoire is so excited about it and signed it into law. The people of the state of Washington right now are posing a legal challenge to put it on a referendum and it will not become law until that referendum is dealt with. And if history is correct, the 92 or 3 percent of the population will reject having marriage be redefined by the 5 or 6 percent. 
That's because we have citizens who understand the issues. As long as we live here, we have to be, according to Scripture, good citizens. We have to understand the issues that are before us. You may say, eh, I don't know, you know, I'm just kind of passing through, I don't live in You are affected by these issues. And as long as God has given you a choice, you have a responsibility to do things like read the voters' pamphlet. How many of you read the voters' pamphlet when it comes to the house? John, good for you, John. Look at you, Ben. Chris? Yeah, yeah. Read the voters' pamphlet. Look at the issues. Sometimes they're boring. Sometimes they're hard to understand. Read the pros versus the cons. They have people that are for the argument. They have people who are against the argument. Read those different things. Become conversant on the issues. Why? Because you're a good citizen. And we are called to be good citizens of the societies that we live in. Our love for Christ and the fact that we follow Christ supersedes any type of political, social political system. We were having this conversation yesterday. Communism, democracy, monarchy, it, it doesn't matter what the system is, we are still called to participate and to be good citizens. If you haven't worked on this, work on it. It's very important, I'm here to tell you. Let's skip ahead to verse 14. We're almost, well, no, no, let's go back to... Uh, there's a couple here that are important. Verse 12, it is foolish to belittle one's neighbor, a sensible person keeps quiet. My neighbor across the street from me thinks it's a holiday every day of the year. They have their Christmas lights on every night. How do I broach that? I don't know, it's difficult. My neighbor next to me has these two pit bulls. And if you come over to the house, which many of you, I mean almost all of you have, you know that anytime we have a party going on in the backyard or we're out, I could be mowing the lawn in the backyard. And those two pit bulls are just going at a rage. That, I don't know, they don't like me. What, what am I supposed to say to this guy? I mean, I, it, those are, I, you know, I just don't know. I don't make a big fuss about it because I don't know him that well. And although we've lived together for almost 20 years, he's not really very talkative and he's kind of a little bit strange. So I, I just I just try to you know live in an honorable fashion and keep my yard clean and do all the things that I'm supposed to. So scripture says, don't be you know messing around with your neighbor. It's too foolish to belittle your neighbor. A sensible person keeps quiet. And he waves to me. He waves to me as he leaves. That's our greeting. It's just driving away anyways. I'm okay with that. Verse 13. A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. Scripture, even in the Old Testament, talks about people who are gossips. Don't be a gossip. You are going to know things about people. Don't tell other people about what you know. Be careful about what you say about other people. Scripture says we're not to gossip. Now, some of you may be thinking, me, Pastor? Really, Pastor? Gossip is universal. People think, well, women gossip. When women get together, their little hand sessions and they talk about this, that, and the other thing. The, the gossip just flies. Let me tell you something. Men gossip too. They do it differently. It's not quite the same. Not as catty. But men gossip too. God's word says, 
Don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> Try to do that. Keep quiet. In the book of James it says what? The tongue is the hardest to control. If you can learn to control the tongue, you can learn to control your whole body. Gossip is about controlling the tongue. Gossip, let me tell you something. God, you, you guys are all about relationship. I get this one me all the time. Dad, you're not about relationship. You need to work on being more relational. Okay, I'm working on it. But here's the thing. Let me tell you something. Gossip destroys relationship. So if you want to have good relationships, keep your mouth shut, don't talk about others, and mind your own business. That's what Scripture says. In Peter, it talks about mind your own business. So I mind my own business. So I don't really worry about what other people say. People want to talk about me, they're insecure in dealing with me, that's their problem. I know you all say that's a relational issue, but, but that's really the bottom line. But I'll tell you this, you won't hear me, and I know lots, I know all of your secrets. You know why I know your secrets? It's my job. I'm the pastor. I know the difficulties that you're going through. I know your backgrounds. I know what you're struggling with. I know all of those things. I don't tell nobody nothing. Because scripture says, I'm not supposed to. Don't you do it either. Don't you do it either. Without wise leadership, we just go back to the citizen thing. Without wise leadership, a nation falls. Oh, Lord. Have mercy, are we not seeing that today? We have people in leadership in our nation today that I tell you, you just can't fix, stupid. I don't know how some of these people got where they are today. But it just, the idiocy amazes me. We are in danger as a nation. Without wise leadership, a nation falls. There is safety in having many advisors. Mm. 15, we're almost there. 15. There's danger in putting up security for a stranger's debt. It's safer not to guarantee another person's debt. Okay, here's a practical thing that you can grab hold of. Unless it's your child, and there are some conditions I would think about, but basically the rule of Scripture is, we'll do this the, the, the tax way. You know what the tax way is? You state the rule. Lucas, what's the tax? I want to make <laughs> <laughs> Oh, come on, you customer service people or foreman. What's the what's the rule, Wendy? The tax way. You state the rule, and then you let the exceptions follow. And the exceptions. The exceptions. Well, they're you know interesting. But in tax law, the rule is stated, and then there are exceptions to the rule. That's how tax law works. Okay. We'll do this the tax law way. What is the rule? Do not be security for somebody else's loan. Got that? What this is saying is that if you are not to be a co-signer for somebody else on their loan. Now this is a common practice. You need to get a loan, you can't afford to get a loan because your credit's in the toilet or you have an established credit or whatever and the banks will say to you, well if you can get a co-signer, somebody that we can trust, somebody who's trustworthy, and they have a history of showing that, then we'll give you the loan. So you have people who will come to you and say, can you sign with me so I can get this loan? Scripture says, 
Don't do it. Now, that's the rule. There are exceptions to that that I would say. They're not they're my opinion. They're not biblical. They're, 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 uh, but they're based upon relationship. And since I'm a relational type of person, I'm working on it. Since I'm working on being relational, if my children come to me and say, Dad, can you co-sign with me? Then I will co-sign with my children up to a point. Up to a point. So when my kids first got their cars, I co-signed with my kids so that they could get their cars. And the deal was very simple. I'm co-signing because I'm your dad. So I'm going to help you out here. But here's the deal. You miss one payment, and that car becomes my car. Because they're going to be coming after me to pay the bill. And if I'm paying for it, it's my car. When my children got older, I would put time frames on it. And I would say, I'll sign for your car, I'll co-sign with you so we can get you started here, you can get your car. You have six months to get it set up and off of my, my name is off of there completely. My kids have been very good at doing what they need to do. <laughs> I'm telling you, I listen to stories every day of parents that have obligated themselves to pay for their children's debt. I will not do that. Or their nieces or their nephews. If you do, I will just tell you up front, don't ever come to me, you're a member of my church, I love you, I care for you as members of my church, don't ever think that you can come to me and borrow money. First of all, because I don't have it, so, so don't ask. But second of all, because that's not what the Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches do not be surety for somebody else. Be careful of this, because it's a common practice in our society. And there are many people who end up being obligated to pay the debts of somebody else or their lives are ruined. This is a way to protect yourself. Don't fall into this. Okay, last one. By the way, no cards or letters, emails. I didn't write this. This is God's word. This is what Solomon is saying. Don't be telling me that I'm harsh and I'm not, you know, relational, but that's... I'm just telling you what God's Word says. And I, in my old age, have found it to be true. Last one. A gracious woman gains respect, but a ruthless man gain only wealth. A gracious woman gains respect, but ruthless men only gain wealth. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, basically, it's talking about relationship. And that's a good place to end. It's talking about relationship. Relationship is something that we need to learn how to have. And women. Why is it talking about a gracious woman gains respect? Because women predominantly are relational. That's how God designed you. That's how you were made. It is God's design that women are relational. And when you are gracious and when you are relational and you build others up and you do those things that God has designed you to do, you gain the respect of those around you. Men are not designed to be relational. Men are goal oriented And, you know, in today's society, we have kind of a unique situation because we have so many 
people that um, have different types of occupations. But if you look at the history of mankind, you will find that predominantly the ones who have always been in the forefront of society were warriors. Warriors. And men went out and gained respect by being ruthless conquerors. And what scripture is saying is that the only thing you gain from that is well. And what happens when you die? Can't take it with you. Can't take it with you. You can't take you off with you. But what have we been learning about legacy? You can establish a legacy. You can establish a following, or you can establish that which is going to be held over after you die. Being ruthless is not, according to Scripture, beneficial, and it will go away. So as, as we mature men, Scripture indicates that we should learn how to develop in our relationships. Those things will last. Next week, two things are going to happen. First thing is, is that we are going to have our normal cell group participation suspended so that you guys might participate in uh, our, normal, uh, our normal deal. I haven't figured out what we're going to do as far as what it's going to be, but it'll be a challenge for all of you. We have just gone through chapter 10 and the first 16 verses of chapter 11. So if you're going to study during the week for being able to be conquerors in regards to our games next week, those are the passages you should study. Because if I'm going to write questions or I'm going to draw anything from anywhere, it's going to be chapter 10 and the first 16 verses of chapter 11. You are so warned. Do not say to me, Pastor Monty, where did you come up with that question? Right here. It's right here. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, is that you are going to be so happy because James is going to be sharing next week. And we'll take over going through Proverbs and give his insight into God's Word and how it practically is to be lived out. We'll be excited. All right, let's uh, stand. Let's close the word for Father, thank you for this time that we set aside to worship you, to praise you, and particularly, Lord, thank you for um, your word. That not only is it ethereal, that it gives us theories about how it is that we'll respond to things, not only is it something that we ascribe to as a theological treatise or, or a religious understanding, but that, Father, very practically, your word guides us on how we're to make choices that will benefit us and glorify you. Father, I pray that each here, as they look at the Proverbs, as they read through Proverbs, as we gain an understanding of how we should live, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each of us. Help us, Lord, to function in such a way that we choose wisely, that we choose actions which would guide us to a knowledge of who you are, and that, Lord, you would be glorified through how it is that we live. Strengthen each one here as we go out one from another. This, uh, this, uh, this body is so busy with activities, Father. And yet in all these activities, we seek to glorify you. Strengthen us. Allow us to be able to do so, that your name might be lifted up. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding grace, 
To the only wise God, Jesus Christ, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. May God bless you.
Uh, possibly. It, it might cost more depending on the color cost. Oh, you mean yellow on black instead of a yellow shirt with black. Okay, and and that's what I was saying is the color cost of it could cost more. If the shirt's yellow, it could cost more depending on the color. So you want yellow paint? Well, see, we don't have yellow paint, so then we'd have to buy yellow paint. <laughs> Yeah. I will look into it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
not take me to murder.